So, Julie Resche, thank you for joining us today in the IPU library talk. Uh, this is a little um, academic intellectual uh, talk show, sadly with no couches, uh, but uh, I, I hope you have a, a comfortable chair at home uh, where I take the opportunity to um, speak with interesting, innovative scholars from the domain of psychoanalysis about their work, about their new work. It's an opportunity for me to read um, the books published uh, by authors, and I've read, Julie, I've read your book and prepared some, some questions that I'd like to ask you about it. And it, basically, it's an opportunity to present your work, Julie, uh, to uh, uh, an English reading crowd in Germany, as well as other interested uh, readers worldwide. And uh, I hope... Uh, I see we have uh, quite a lot of people joining us today, so I hope it will be fruitful for all. Format is quite simple. We're going to have um, some uh, a talk between us, Julie, for about an hour, and then we'll open up the stage for questions. And whoever has a question, please speak it um, with your mouth, with your face, uh, rather than posting it on the chat. So that's uh, usually how we do that here. Good. Julie, are you ready? No. <laughs> good, good answer. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, so I when when I was reading your book, um, I had this um, this feeling or this idea that uh, you engage in a way or partake in a way in the uh, what is called the anti psychiatry movement, uh, which we know historically has questions the dynamics between doctor and patient and also uh, critiqued uh, the emphasis of, on adaptation uh, in the treatment and also challenged the idea of in, the internment of individuals that are considered mentally ill. So I wanted to first ask you if you could share with us how your work fits into this tradition. And if you could um, also tell us who are the key thinkers and ideas that uh, have influenced your approach to negative psychoanalysis. And we'll talk about this concept very soon. We'll get deep into that. So we, we basically would love to hear about uh, the scholarly roots of your project. Well, it's the wrong question to ask because it's, it's not important, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And anti-psychiatry, it, it sounds similar, but my problem was, and um, I can relate to it in partially, um, but my problem with anti-psychiatry is that it's normally represented uh, with conservative motive in it. Mm -hmm. Like it's better the whole thing went wrong. Let's come back to the they don't they might not say directly, but I have a feeling that this is what implied like the medicalization of society, uh, psychologization of society, not only uh, anti anti psychiatry but the anti uh, psychology even, mm -hmm. which is the domin dominating domineering discourse today. And I'm trying to I'm looking for and expressing something I hope different and um, especially having philosophical background it's quite hard to relate to this kind of discourse that it's um, starts to be a common sense today so uh, Philippe Reef is useful here the one I'm talking about in the book I'm starting with him mm -hmm. uh, the one who talks about this domination of psychology psychological human being that is the basic type of human being now, the way we think, the way we relate to each other. We use terms of psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, it comes to substitute religious perspective, like the, the, which was dominating before. And But Philippe Rief precisely is a problem. And this is problematic thinking because it, it feels like it's better. It was better before we were more moral or there was... Um, it went wrong for him. So I don't think it. they both are not, I'm not okay with both of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to look for something um, different from this, something that I won't, I will be able to tolerate at least because I have trouble tolerating things. So, and the philosophers, thinkers, uh, people who I find, who I can tolerate <laughs> more or less partially is uh, Philip Zappe, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my, um, I mean, Petra vessels up, uh, one of my mm-hmm. favorite philosophers who um, exposes, uh, we can call him uh, depressive realism, mm-hmm. uh, who exposes the positive, maybe uh, the psychologization of society that it hides the painful, well, for him, it was painful truths of how it, it really is that we are suffering and we doomed in a way. And also existential, also only partially tolerate all of those. Existential approach with Heidegger, precisely mm-hmm. being towards death um, mm-hmm. and resonating concept in, uh, again, I have problems with existentialism, with Heidegger too, mm-hmm. too positively oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, and in psychoanalysis, the concept that resonates the most with me is uh, uh, death drive, but not in not that much in Freudian and Lacanian interpretation, but more with Sabina Spielrein interpretation. Mm-hmm. And those people, thinkers who try to uh, develop these concepts, uh, I find something that I like in it and and I'm misreading them uh, in the way I want. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, uh, those who pick up the book should expect to to encounter these uh, these scholars. Um, Also, maybe uh, I I can note uh, Alenka Zupancic, who appears several times in the book, and uh, Todd McGowan. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anyone. Uh, But let's... Exactly, Malabu, that's also true. Yes, a very important concept from her. We'll get there in, in I have prepared an interesting question about that. Uh, but let's get to the title of the book. It's called Negative Psychoanalysis for the Living Dead, a Philosophical Pessimism and the Death Drive. And that's a, a fascinating and evocative uh, title, I think. Uh, to me, it brings to mind images of zombie movies and the walking dead, uh, and I wanted to ask if you could explain to us what do you mean by uh, the living dead in the context of the book? Who who are they and how do they relate to the themes of your work? So uh, for me, it's each of a human being. And precisely, I do imagine like I see the zombie walking <laughs> as the actual the core of human um, as such. But to be honest, I regret almost all of the words in um, in the title. Maybe I'm still okay with the negative, but the way what people expect when I talk about negativity, it's not the negativity I'm talking about. So initially, the idea of the negative was to be directly in contrast of the positive, like it's understood as a common sense, positive psychology, which is the golden standard of psychology, not as a negativity within psychoanalysis, which is different uh, thing. And I'm not interested in it that much. I regret psychoanalysis because it's um, it's like m- my version of psychoanalysis very reduced that it doesn't resemble that much. Like I got rid of everything that is basic for psychoanalysis and it irritates people and I understand them. Uh, for the living dead, mm-hmm. I'm still okay with it because it resonates with this idea of a death drive as the basic drive that we are not actually, each of us is not actually alive. And it was Heidegger concept of being towards death that existence is approaching uh, your end, at end and folding within life, death operating within existence. And this is what actually existence is, at least for Heidegger human existence. So we are uh, living is living dead. And there is nothing, you cannot uh, abandon death, so you cannot overcome death because this is what uh, unfolds in existence. So at the court, just to show that uh, it's uh, not exactly for the living, but it's about the human being as a living dead. And um, philosophical pessimism, uh, I would rather substitute on now, uh, on depressive realism, but I'm not in agreement with depressive realism that much, too, was the core of it. And uh, what else is, well, the death drive is fine, except for I'm mostly talking about Freudian death drive. And I regret not talking about enough um, about Sabina Spielrein death drive, but I'm going to talk elsewhere uh, about it. And when I said that it's not, 
the thinkers and the tradition that influenced me, they're not that important. And they are not important. I'm not, it, this is not a book where I'm trying to contribute to some kind of discourse or something or uh, analyze certain thinkers or see what they say and contribute to uh, their theories, even if I mind, but um, I'm rather using them the way I want to use them. And Catherine Malabu, uh, for example, told me not to use the way I'm using her concept. I'm still doing it. But mm -hmm. the point is that it rather what, it's not that it inspired me, but what I'm writing about, it's my my own maybe depression, mm -hmm. uh, as long as I'm okay with the word depression, because it's still a uh, psychological discourse, but let's just keep it. And But depression, not as... Um, not as uh, something that requires treatment, but as a mode of being. Maybe in a similar way you talk about autistic, like autism, not as the condition that requires treatment, but um, but as a mode of being. Mm -hmm. And I would also maybe claim that at least as experiment, I consider human subject, subject as such, as depressed, Mm -hmm. And uh, through my own depression, uh, me as a subject, maybe. Uh, and this is the, the assumption in the book that I'm analyzing, not through that much going somewhere elsewhere outside of me into what uh, certain thinkers claim, but uh, finding through me, finding what resonates, what I would be still okay uh, describing the human being as such, what doesn't irritate me. Um, and normal subject, neutral subject, uh, the assumption that is prevailing, existing, is that it's not depressed. And uh, I'm trying to show subject as uh, substantially the depressed subject, not as a type of subject, but just in case subject as such. And whoever can relate to it, again, and there are people who surprisingly can relate to it. And existential, some parts of the existentialism, like Heidegger's concept and Freudian concept, Lacanian concepts, in my interpretation at least, they can, I would use those concepts to just show it, uh, trying to experiment with this kind of presenting subject in such a way. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so let's then try and um, distinguish your work then from these fields that it branches from, and as you say, takes on its uh, its own uh, direction. Hmm? Um, this specific term uh, that is introduced uh, that I do think is a very interesting term: negative psychoanalysis. Uh, this is a term uh, that uh, a, a Russell a Jacobi introduces. Jacobi. Jacobi. Uh, and he's an American, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, um, so he he introduces this term, and you go into that in the book as as a way to critique the use of uh, psychoanalysis merely as a means to adapt individuals to society, which is a a perspective that grew in the United States uh, and became quite strong today. And he he wanted to return to Freud's original intent by focusing on psychoanalysis as a critical and even disruptive force. And you mention in your book a twist on his concept, and I'll, I'll quote it. I'll quote a, a paragraph from your book and just ask you to, to tell us a little bit more about it. So uh, you write in the book, while conventional psychotherapy is inherently focused on the well-being of the living individual, and Jacobi's negative psychoanalysis on improving and transforming society for the better, negative psychoanalysis, in my interpretation, would be focused on the negative dialectical space of rupture and the mutual cancellation of society and the individual. So I found this quote to be very intriguing, and I, I wanted you to maybe expand on what negative psychoanalysis originally means and how your interpretation shifts and builds on Jacobi's ideas. Yeah, you found one complicated thought in the book and you quoted it. And I'm not able to explain what I meant in this precise book, but I can simplify. And when I started to do what I'm doing, um, 
which uh, was initially criticism of and making fun of uh, psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone told me uh, that what I do resembles uh, this concept of Jacobi's concept of negative psychoanalysis. Before, I would call it jokingly necropsychoanalysis, but it's like too creepy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I wasn't attempting to practice it, it's just the creepy word to uh, maybe the parody of neuropsychoanalysis. The, mm-hmm scientific psychoanalysis mm-hmm. um, and with the obsession was the death and all the trauma and stuff but uh, it, there are there are some things that would resemble in this negative psychoanalysis the way uh, Jacoby is talking about it so I reappropriated it and again misusing it um, including in the title of the book for him uh, is the sub- substitution or synonym um, of a uh, critical psychoanalysis. So he belongs to critical theory, tradition of critical theories like Adorno, Marcuse, and uh, he just, what he calls negative psychoanalysis is the word to use for the theory of psychoanalysis, the way it was appropriated by critical theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would distinguish uh, psychoanalysis is practice as psychoanalysis with uh, from theory that w- they would be okay only with the theory as uh, as far as it has uh, critical impact and um, they would criticize uh, psychology psychologization of society and this positive attitude in society because for them it um, it has to do with capitalist exploitation the trying to make people happy uh, Adorno would claim and Marcuse would claim in the sick society, which is for them cap- capitalist society, would mean to make them sick. And uh, this internalization of problems like the psychotherapy, not only psychoanalysis, but psychotherapy as such, would be interested in a personal, now it's called well being, this or personal happiness. And for them, this n- nurturing happy consciousness, what they called, is goes again critical consciousness so the message the message would end this serves like be a baby part of a coherent part of the capitalist society this is how conformist psychology including psychoanalytic uh, therapy serves perpetuates capitalist exploitation mm-hmm. and they would be okay with uh, theory so negative psychoanalysis critical psychoanalysis is a theory that uh, cherishes maybe uh, unhappy consciousness, critical consciousness, revolutionary spirit. But um, my problem with this conceptualization that they are overly positive because instead of curing individual, they would still cure but society. It's Mm -hmm. still uh, aimed at happiness, but uh, happiness of society, which means um, my problem is that it means that Unhappiness is foreign. You can, this idea that you can get rid of it, of course, it's not that simple. But still, there is this um, hope uh, that this kind of negative psychoanalysis, as critical psychoanalysis, is temporary measure. And then we'll, what, are going to be happy <laughs> all together as a society. Mm-hmm. So I'm more interested in psychoanalysis or anything that wouldn't escape the suffering and won't see the human being as depressed as such let's maybe we don't know if you can get rid of it what if you cannot what is this the main thing the basis and <laughs> if we get rid of it we'll get rid of the whole thing mm-hmm. so um the for me negative psychoanalysis is um maybe against or alternative way of thinking or an operating if there is a way of operating uh curing instead of curing uh, unhappiness and aiming at happiness I'm just um, maybe admitting in a way that unhappiness or depression is um, co-constitutive with the existence as such mm-hmm. I forgot the question <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay usually we say just go on hmm? it doesn't matter the question doesn't matter um, but yeah, let me let me give you a, a little nudge uh, in direction of uh, Malabu, because you were you were mentioning uh, her asking you not to use that concept. I'd love to hear more about that, because uh, you mentioned in the book that you have this deep appreciation for uh, Catherine Malabu's concept of destructive plasticity. It's an interesting concept, and 
you mention it particularly in the context of uh, discussing the productive aspects of a trauma. And this is a theme I've seen it around, going around. Uh, some refer to it as traumaphilia you know, it's in the psychological and cultural studies uh, groups. So I want to, to share with us um, well, wh what draws you to this concept and how does it help uh, articulate your views on the potential of negativity more effectively? And if you could add a little bit of gossip on Malabu as, as you go, that would be great. Yeah, so I like the Malabo's concept of destructive plasticity because it's criticism of Freud um, death drive. Like she would claim that death drive is not actually death drive. Uh, it's still seen as the deviation. Like Freud still preserves his basic logic in which death drive doesn't actually fit. And she tries to radicalize it, um, the death drive, and suggest the concept of destructive plasticity, which I appreciate this very move that death drive is not actually death drive and destructive plasticity is the death drive. Um, and she uses the term to see to show that destructivity, destructive processes can be um, can form forms can be formational. Unlike in Freud, it's only the destruction. Destruction never forms mm -hmm. forms. Uh, so the destructive plasticity is the concept to show that destruction is can be creative. Uh, creation occurs through destruction. And she uses this term to, um, and she uses the concept of the living dead. But for her, most of the time, it's uh, to describe a certain type of people, <coughs> uh, those who are uh, with brain lesions, with physical traumas of brain or the trauma. Uh, they're called trauma survivals. I'm not sure one can survive trauma, but it's still category. And because it's a certain a group of people, uh, it doesn't reach what I would want to reach. It shows human being as mm -hmm. uh, as uh, driven by death driven in Freudian sense. And Freud also, if he fails, if he fails to show it as a central drive, mm -hmm. um, and Catherine Malabu actually shows it as the central drive she only does it for a certain group of people and i'm trying to um expand it for some reason to show the human being um that our psyche is the result of uh, destruction there is no non-destructive plasticity in neurobiology both and in existential one can say and uh, dimension and this is what is wrong with uh, the way i'm using it because if you coin a term to describe uh, certain processes uh, um, that occur in human psyche, the formation of a self through trauma, for example, the post-traumatic self. And if you precisely develop it to describe this process, and someone would come and claim that this is the only process like me, then all the formation of any self is this kind of formation. It is problematic. So once um, when her book uh, on destructive plasticity only came out, I went to see her uh, during a workshop and I presented quite a while ago and I presented this kind of thinking, uh, talking to her about her grandmother who suffered with um, Alzheimer for some reason, because she uses her grandmother as a main example in a book because her new uh, identity was, one can say, post um, post traumatic. It was a rupture from her the self of her the, her old self, which Catherine Malabu would recognize as her grandmother. And uh, destructive plasticity is to describe this kind of processes. And I claim that she is also Catherine Malabu herself, also pro uh, product of destructive plasticity. Because and the book is the product of destructive plasticity because she is um, like she's traumatized through this experience and she herself is changed as a result of this trauma of someone uh, changing uh, significantly and maybe there is no non traumatic uh, non traumatic change in self maybe the self as such 
first it's illusionary, a second it's a product of trauma. Like there is no nothing else except for variation of uh, trauma and except for variation of destruction. There is no non-destructive creation of self. And this is more like coming back to Sabina Spielrein uh, mm. perspective. And Alien Kazupancic, my um, mentor, also told me not to use, not to misuse it, the, um, the, the, the concept of the destructive plasticity. Mm. But there's nothing I can do. <laughs> Stop. So you so you did it, and here is the book. I really love the concept, and I'm I'm sorry, but <laughs> there's nothing I can do. Mm. Uh, well, m- maybe we can take a step uh, because I, the book is constructed in a way that uh, you spend some time uh, in the middle of the book speaking about. Uh, society and understanding the notion of um, destructive plasticity or negative psychoanalysis in this context. Um, So um, let's speak a little bit about that. Um, And I'll paraphrase maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll paraphrase uh, from uh, that part of the book uh, that you argue that at the core of uh, our relationships um, lies a radical negativity. And that our social bonds are not built on harmony or happiness, uh, but rather on rupture, on pain, on void. And this suggests that, uh, well, this suggests a view on society uh, driven by a kind of inherent negativity, as you've just commented in terms of subject formation or death drive. And I wanted to ask you specifically, and this is a saying that that repeats in the book, if you could explain uh, what you mean uh, when you suggest that society is death driven. And I might sort of just give a little challenge here, sort of because this is what came to my mind when I read this. And I wanted to, to ask you to maybe tell us how does your perspective go beyond Freud's ideas, uh, such as the ideas we see in the myth of the primal father, and the notion of discontent in civilizations, especially in in understanding the negative foundation of the social bond. Hmm. Uh, So the uh, idea of a death drive as social, as Hmm. the basis of a social bond, actually rely a lot on Todd McGovern, uh, because his experience um, was, I mean, uh, what he did, uh, instead of only seeing it as his experiment of thought, instead of seeing it as Freud, uh, he claims, just reducing it into individual. No, he doesn't criticize Freud for that. He just, for him, it's interesting to see it as the, uh, not only at the basis, as a basic drive for individual psyche, but also expanded to analyze the social bond um, Mm-hmm. as basis also death driven but uh, unknowingly he actually comes back to the sabina spielrein who is was the one to introduce the concept of a death drive and then freud is taking it from her and then uh todd mcgowan expands it without knowing about sabina spielrein origin mm-hmm. of um, a death drive mm-hmm. uh, like does the same operation with it without knowing it. For Sabina Spirain, it was initially inter-social. Mm-hmm. And which is a very interesting, uh, when I first learned about the concept of a death drive in Freud, I really like it, unlike the rest of the Freud. And it's it's strange that it was actually introduced by uh, by woman of, uh, they, they would claim that she's of Russian origin, but I would claim that she's of Ukrainian origin because, um, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, doesn't matter. Let's not go into politics, maybe. But there is something about her uh, imaginary that is uh, that introduces. It was initially, let's say, it was initially the concept of a death drive. Initially, intersubjective. Freud takes it into his theory, which is uh, mostly about individual psyche, and then Todd McGowan again expands it to intersubjective. But in in a bit different way. But this very movement of um, death drive as not within us, but in between us, or both, everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what I'm trying to follow. 
mm -hmm. uh, talking, for example, about love and uh, that's it, love <laughs> as as death driven, and it's quite different from Freud, um, like n not in the maybe particular instances where he uh, would one could say that he would show death drive as it operates in society or in relation to others. It's just more like on a more basic level. I think it's different. And I think Sabina Spirain is different, even though she's trying, she's talking in her work um, with Freud. So she's trying to fit in psychoanalysis, but she already introduces the, one could say, feminist critique of as far as it's po it was possible um, in 1912 to introduce femi feminist position. But there is something about the basic image of a subject that she offers that goes against Freud basic and psychoanalytic uh, image of the subject. I think that, well, it's possible to claim that it's a feminine subject Mm. And like of uh, masculine. And maybe this is what irritates me and I'm not able to accept in Freud. Like there's, I cannot relate to it. Mm. Maybe because it is um, this, um, what I'm not accepting uh, is the basic um, in Freud, uh, the, basic dis the basic discussion of sexuality, like it's a huge importance. And uh, in Lacan, it's the importance of language and symbolic. Maybe because it's it starts from a male body and mm. desire and joy, <laughs> enjoyment. For me, it's the I'm trying to see different kind of subject, and avoiding these terms, and see what kind of subject will appear a fem feminine subject, mm. because the desire and uh, it's male subject in psychoanalysis, a subject, neutral subject in psychoanalysis. We know it's male, but this is where the and the uh, sexuality driven male, there is the idea of human inside of them, it's kind of self with the desires uh, trying to survive and satisfy the need that comes from inside. You have penis that shows the direction of desire, like this whole uh, description of human being and you go outside of yourself and you find the way to satisfy it which is normally the heterosexual norm is a woman you are reappropriated re so this is the pleasure principle this is the in the principle of individual as um, pursuing their own interest like there is other sabina spiegelman if you misinterpret her like i do at least this is different um, type of subject um, mm -hmm. from this basic in my primitive understanding of Freud it's the woman it's not the sexuality that much because there are other in reproductive uh, processes there are other processes like the uh, birth giving or breastfeeding those are and um, psychoanalysis so normally either perceives them as secondary in relation to sexuality or within the scope of sexuality and one can claim I can start with them and do the other way around. Sexuality would be included or part of this. So where the mother is the central figure and it doesn't operate in the same way. Like there is someone inside of you, you have, there is a desire and you try to, there is a direction of desire and you try to satisfy. It's a completely different thing. There is nothing inside you. This is loose irregular about um, this sex, which is not one. There is no one inside. You're not appropriating. Feminine is not appropriating outside of this. It's different. You expand, you decentralize with the pregnancy. You are uh, rather... Sacrifying, uh, Lucy Rigare would talk about nearness. It's not reappropriation going outside, knowing even what you want, like, or trying to survive. There's like that's different, completely different reality from Freudian, even Lacanian um, reality. There is no sexuality in this way. It's all rather on expansion and inclusion into care, and there is you who is actually absent, there is nothing inside of you and you sacrifice this 
nothing. This is a feminine subject. And this is something Sabina Spirain would talk. So in relation to the death drive, the death instinct, this is the operation. There is, it's in between. There is no me using you. There is you, there is me and we using each other um, for pleasure. Like there's whole and <laughs> different thing. And Freud would take her idea, combine it with... Um, Schopenhauer and actually put it back into his framework, the one that I just explained with the penis and desire and direction. Um, so I'm trying to formulate, uh, maybe I'm failing to formulate this different uh, comprehension and still preserving, going back to Sabine Spielrein, maybe uh, avoiding like, Freud to some extent. And and hopefully you you will fail a little bit more uh, when writing about it in the future. Uh, it's interesting you raise this uh, because it is it does appear in the book um, at some point uh, this argument that you've made right now that I, I personally found to be uh, most fascinating, maybe the one that most fascinated me um, in the book, um, and particularly uh, I'll, I'll, this is an opportunity to ask a question that I didn't plan to ask then. Um, you you explore Freud's idea that the social bond uh, stems from an initial state of narcissism, as you were saying, something that is more masculine, aimed at pleasure and self-preservation. But then there's a part in the book where you mention theories from uh, Balby or Winnicott uh, to introduce this idea of a subject other dimension. This is a subtype of, a, I think you would call it a collective existence. Uh, and you have a certain discussion about, you know, what comes first, sort of the chicken and the egg question. And uh, you argue that, well, maybe in the subject that you're describing, uh, this arrives prior to narcissism, let's say prior to sexuality, as you're saying uh, right now. And really, I find this argument compelling. And when you visited us here in Berlin and you gave a lecture, the IPU, I think I commented on that as well in your lecture. You mentioned it. Hmm? Um, it specifically speaks to me. I'll tell you why. I'll share with you a little bit and I'll ask the question later. Because of a certain misconception of uh, or misunderstanding of the concept of autoerotism in Freud, a concept that gets thrown at me quite a lot because it sounds similar to autism, although it doesn't have a lot to do with it. Um, and this is where critics interpret um, autoerotism as a state where the subject exists without an external world. But this is exactly narcissism for Freud. Uh, so I believe, on the contrary, that Freud suggests that it's more about a world without a distinct subject or ego. And remember, autoerotism is a, is a prior stage uh, in Freud's uh, theory of, of uh, libidinal uh, development. So, uh, so maybe it's, a, it's an opportunity where you could say a little bit more, maybe even beyond what you say in the book, on this concept of the primordial togetherness in pain, I think that you present in the book, I thought it resonates with, with what you're saying right now. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit, how does this idea further our understanding of human uh, connectedness uh, and also the formation of the self or a subject, as you were saying, that is feminine? Mm -hmm. So the connectedness maybe doesn't interest me that much as pain in this in this context. I guess it was trying to show that there is no connectedness through the pain, and which is pain is the feeling of a rupture. Mm -hmm. So there is the rupture and connectedness. It's the same thing, paradoxically, whatever the, whatever it means. And with auto eroticism, it's actually very interesting. Um, very interesting. Uh, observation that it's not narcissistic, like that's the opposite. Again, Luce Irigaray, I'm just teaching feminist philosophy this semester. So every year <laughs> it's closer to spring, I'm becoming feminist. Mm -hmm. But um, Luce Irigaray talks about uh, autoeroticism. I don't like term because it's eroticism in there. And if you talk about woman, you include her back into the scene as the deviation of a male. But right. anyway, for her, is the female autoeroticism is different from male autoeroticism. Like male is essentially masturbating, 
Mm-hmm. Wherever is auto erotic and a woman is engaged into this process as the part of it. So it's still narcissistic to satisfy his desire. But different model, female model of auto eroticism is that uh, she's um she's neither one nor two. She, mm-hmm. It's not there is no one inside. Mm-hmm. She is she would say sex in herself. I wouldn't say that uh, she's sex. It's just the different. Let's say she's pregnant. <laughs> Amazing um, substitution. But she is not one. She is decentered. She doesn't exist. If she goes into her, she won't uh, find anything in her. At, at the same time, she will find everything and everyone. And Sabina Spiderin, great observation that when you look into yourself, for some reason, she uses uh, she uses Nietzsche as an example of a mother. But okay. okay, if you look inside, you discover your mother, and through this, you become a mother. And there's like the whole process of discovering whole world. You are not you. Inside of you is the absence of you, someone who sacrificed their uh, the life, uh, their life, and through this, you becoming you um, becoming not who you are, not the self, but you whatever reproduce. So, and that's the whole process of the self that doesn't exist, the self that is wants to survive or and uh, has desire to satisfy. It's completely different auto-eroticism. It includes the whole world. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's interesting to think how the rapture or the from other would work here, the rapture that at the same time connects. Uh, I don't know, maybe this is the rapture from you which is essentially non-existence. And this is how you connect to the other and or create the other, something like it. But that's different model, including we can talk about auto-eroticism as not, as not self-enclosed. Well, with narcissism is also interesting because it's when you panic, discovering that you don't exist and you don't matter. This is what we all do now. <laughs> With narcissism, basically the opposite at the core of narcissism. It's not about you. It's about the panic that um, you need to present yourself as you mean someone and find the um, justification of you as existence and you not you fail finding it. That's why we all appear narcissistic, but essentially just uh, very hurt. Mm. It it reminds me, you've mentioned love and uh, maybe we'll go there, but it reminds me of a certain notion of, of love, this sort of um, uh, togetherness uh, that you mentioned, uh, not the narcissistic love, as you say, but uh, a love that begins uh, prior to a, the rupture with the other. Mm. Maybe you, you you can say a little bit about that about love. I think you mentioned this in chapter four. You you offer a short thesis on love, um, and uh, well, love and the death drive particularly. And it's a, a love is a topic that's very close to my heart, as you know. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit uh, on your insight on how you see the relationship between love and death in the book. What, what how do you describe it exactly? Well, for me, it's same. <laughs> like whatever you mentioned, for me, it's a death, trauma, suffering, and um, because normally love would be perceived as the opposite, as the um, merging and happiness and bliss, and um, that's the core of love. And the rest of the love that doesn't feel that way would be seen as corrupted or um, not the way it's supposed to be. And uh, I'm trying to present love as everything else as suffering, trauma, rupture, and the negative stuff. And in this way, it's uh, the concept of a social pain, which comes, uh, which was inspired by attachment theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, The idea that um, there is no way to feel for the, the concept of the social pain in psychology and social cognitive neuroscience functions well like now we know that um, we feel this inner pain the pain of separation after attachment theory was developed and after research in social cognitive neuroscience we know that it's proven that a social pain is real it's as real as the pain of the broken limb for example and um, and but neuroscientists are very proud to discover that it, it really hurts they can see it um, on the, uh, as a result of their research and but 
the way scientists present it and the way even attachment theory um, operates now in pop psychology, it presented as we we now know it hurts a lot. We need to find ways to avoid it. But you can read their research differently. There are not, not there is no other way to feel social anything like love or attachment or connection except for pain. You don't. That's how you feel. You only feel it as a separation mm-hmm. and a pain. Which means, for example, if you're in love and uh, you are with the person, and you even if the person is next to you, you cannot have enough. You're missing them. That you feel the impossibility of, and that's love. The pain mm-hmm. is love, the social pain. There is no other way of feeling it. Even in attachment theory, we, which is basically um, mother-child bond, and we uh, develop, we feel attached to mother as initial figure of attachment. But uh, and we need to mother needs to satisfy the need of attachment, but it cannot be satisfied because you only feel it when belonging, meaning you don't have it and you can never have it. Like it's un- precisely this painful principle that it's impossible to satisfy, impossible and the um, social pain, I would claim that it's impossible to avoid because that's how you feel it. You can maybe uh, feel it less or feel it more uh, but it's that's it that's the stuff of uh, love the feeling the rapture the impossibility of having um maybe or merging that is all the love you can get mm-hmm. unfortunately mm-hmm. and in in a way mm, and i'm not so i'm trying to avoid uh calling to you know love each other or be together like take care of each other i'm trying to but i'm failing sometimes and um, because the other thing the isolation which is now criticized people are isolating from each other and we trying to overcome it for me i don't have problem with me because there's also um the way of connection you cannot avoid connection to other you are a connection to other you are intersocial yourself you don't exist so um isolation might be the most intimate way of connection there is no like you cannot be saved and be happy with others either you isolated is pain of being with others or you fighting with others also pain of being with others that's the choice of different forms of being with others either on distance which is not actually because they're inside of you anyway um or um whatever you cannot separate from other you cannot avoid pain mm. Suicide is tempting sometimes. Hmm. Yes, you, you. I think you are very adamant in the book in um, constantly being on guard, uh, being aware uh, of not uh, offering some type of substitute, of uh, solution, of uh, compensation uh, for this uh, essential negativity that you're speaking about. It, it seems like the project itself is this type of insistence and it surfaces in the book uh, from time to time. I want to, to ask you then about this. Um, uh, it, it, clearly the book, and I think rightfully so, uh, discusses the dangers of overly emphasizing positivity. Hmm? And I think we hear on the very same page, uh, this leads to uh, what is often referred to as toxic positivity. Mm? Uh, and I think we've presented some interesting memes in a conference that, uh, that I've seen you recently add to, to exemplify that. Um, but this got me thinking also on the potential risks of focusing too heavily on negativity. Uh, so in the sense, you know, I wanted to ask you if uh, could there, could there be uh, something like toxic negativity then? And how would you distinguish it then from uh, your view on negativity? Well, I came to like toxic positivity, as you know, because before when I was criticized, it all started with criticizing toxic positivity, precisely my mother, like we always um, cheering me up and being naive Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing how uh, life is actually pain and there is no salvation but um, now i came now i'm starting to think quite a while uh, that toxic positivity is um, 
also a form of trauma response. Mm-hmm. If I want to be consistent with the idea of a death drive as it's basic to any human being, not only to depressive human, but even to people who are uh, who expose toxic positivity. So I see it as the as a mecha- as a form of despair, toxic mm. positivity, and it's a horrifying form of despair. Mm. And toxic negativity, that's me, <laughs> toxic mm. in comparison to my mother. Mm. But um, which is also like they're not substantially different. I would maybe if it's not me, then it's um, some sort of depressive realism realist that my book um well, substantially resembles depressive realism, meaning the position that claims that depression gives you more um, realistic perspective. Uh, it's for me, it's toxic, and we can include here Schopenhauer, who claimed that uh, and existentialism. That's my problem because for Heidegger, being towards death brings you authentic existence, which means that you're better than those people who are non authentic. Like it gives you something, you great, you're authentic or singular now, yay. Um, which gives you privilege over other people. And that's my problem. It's um, this, uh, and depressive realist uh, who, who would claim who maybe that maybe pessimistic approach or depressive or sad perception of the world is more realistic one, which means that they are smarter now, better than others, those silly, happy people, which is also very positive t- and toxic. You have a privilege of um, being better than others. So yes. uh, that's what I'm trying to, Avoid. There's the wrong way to be negative, even, well, claiming that there are wrong ways to be negative, meaning showing your superiority, that you are the one who knows how to be negative. I don't know, uh, but like this is not where I want. This is not the negativity. It's supposed to give you nothing, you know, not give you privilege over other people or show you how to do. It's the it's also a form of despair, both depressive realism my negativity and positive uh, toxic positivity are all forms of despair we are all very equal in being pathetic in it mm. to give you nothing huh it's mm. uh, it reminds me of uh, of uh, lacan saying that in love one gives what uh, they do not have and uh, psychoanalysis is a cure through love so the analyst then naturally also uh, gives nothing but this is a very important nothing it is not a nothing hmm? it is not completely a nothing um so so maybe you, uh, i we can go and speak a little bit about the practic practicalities of of negative psychoanalysis and um there's a concluding part to your book where you offer um reluctantly offer some practical advice uh, that is grounded in the concept of embracing negativity without necessarily seeking uh, the positive. And I'll include, uh, it's, it's, it's more than what I'll mention, but this includes um, individual attitudes like um, letting go of the pursuit of a lasting happiness uh, in favor of enjoying fleeting moments of mirth, uh, you call it. Uh, you also say, speak about adopting a stance of compassion that is balanced with a degree of isolation in social interactions. And then you also speak about coming to terms with the inherent monstrosity of nature. And nature is the third big topic uh, in the book. Now, these ideas um, are, as you say, central to the practice of negative psychoanalysis, uh, which you describe as a, as a method that stays loyal to embracing uh, negative realities rather than trying to cure and alleviate suffering. Uh, so instead, it, um, if I remember correctly, it welcomes anxiety and provides a space to share in grief, mourning, and laughter, which I, I found very interesting. Now, on your website, uh, Julie, as and I think we share this type of narcissistic website as just our names.com. For those who want to read more about your work, you can go to that website. Uh, on your website, you mentioned that you offer individual sessions of negative psychoanalysis and also training for those who are interested in, in practicing it. And what I wanted to ask you, if you could give us from your experience, if you could share uh, what a typical 
uh, session of negative psychoanalysis looks like. Um, how do you, as the negative analyst, uh, intervenes? And um, maybe if you can tell us a little bit about the uh, the principles that make uh, the power of negative psychoanalysis to be impactful, to impact, rather than cure, rather than bring happiness, but to have an impact. Yeah, those um, examples are actually examples for, in the conclusion of the wrong conclusions from the book that one might draw, but uh, trying to take it away. Like it's not giving consolation, going to the end of, to the end, not giving. There is nothing that uh, that answer a question what you have to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except for sign up for my session of negative psychoanalysis because I need money. But um, also admitting, I'm trying to, that's what I do in my life, um, negative psychoanalysis or negative practice, connecting two people. Well, to be honest, because that's the only type of connection I can tolerate, this mm -hmm. kind of everything else, I would just pretend be normal and nice. Uh, but I would rather avoid uh, other type of communication with people. So I invented something, my connection to the world and um, people are uh, reaching out, are interested in it. But I'm admitting in the book that it's um, this kind of embracing negativity is absurd because it doesn't need you it doesn't there is nothing that you need to do in relation to it once you discover it. it's like in depression saying telling someone that you need to be even more depressed it doesn't make sense like mm. it's not there is nothing that follows it's rather the different dimension of thinking of communication of existence that doesn't have a goal mm. Maybe there is something similar in Lacanian psychoanalysis. There is there is no goal, and cure treatment is not a goal, at least or cure from cure something like it. The paradoxical side of it. Uh, so it's not um, is different from the direction being directed at the cure from the psychotherapeutic industry and all the types of psychotherapists and coaching and. Uh, that offers you some kind of improvement or something positive, something good, mm -hmm. some form of at least minimal salvation. Mm -hmm. And the negative practice, it's somewhat different, uh, somewhat, well, it is different, but also resembles and resonates with beyond what I'm trying to do, maybe with his, um, his idea of negative capability which he takes from Kiatz, the poet, and uh, the way he uses it to um, to embody it in psychoanalytic practice. It, to some extent, similar because for beyond what he uh, designates with letter O, the space of without end, a beginning, a space of the void, a saying as non-saying as a form of saying or negative capability, meaning uh expanding the capability of not knowing of uncertainty of non-saying of the absence of certainty like this kind of uh the failure of language and uh analysts and analysant are working to expand the this um, dimension of the all of the uh I would say negative space. And the other thing, interest, thing that is interesting about beyond that, he talks about unconsciousness as not within the individual, but in between people. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that this negative thing or the, the what designates letter O is not saying as um, everything else, that it uh, you cannot invited it rather operates on you so my question would be how can you what do you do during the sessions then if it doesn't depend on you you know <laughs> similar with with negativity like it it's not about embracing it it doesn't care if you it's just there you will die you know you die in every moment this negative stuff is central it's operating on you it creates you like you embrace it you don't embrace it it doesn't matter there is no you even so it's it's absurd in this way but um, this kind of glitching 
and failing to do it is maybe the only because of the impossibility of doing it it's the only mode of existence i'm uh, currently capable of for beyond it was problematic because it he fails in my opinion in a trap of the apophatic theologists fail like they would claim that it's all via negativa via the uh, by through the negation of everything but it was the aim to arrive on some better dimension mm -hmm. and for beyond it was arriving to new interpretation of mental growth what is mental growth mm -hmm. like you don't it's not death it just for a while destruction for the sake of the creation it's different process in what i'm still they would all including heidegger um with his being towards death they would all give some kind of reward for this dying and destruction the authentic existence or the mental growth and i'm trying to not to do it it's quite hard uh maybe impossible because even writing a book and giving something to read right and offering um sessions and uh paid sessions it kind of contradicts because if in, if even if you don't give anything you try not to give anything you still get something out of it so it's quite hard but um i'm trying my best not to give anything mm -hmm. well it's um it keeps me uh, curious on the edge of my seat and uh, looking forward to some more things that you're going to bring out for us to to read and explore. Um, I think uh, I'll stop asking questions right now. I have some more if uh, if we're in need, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop asking questions right now. And thank you very much for engaging with me. I think it was a very, very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, but now we'll open it up to uh, the audience.